All right, council, we're back in and uh, we'll start off with any awards or recognitions since we left each other 10 minutes ago. Okay, uh, go to the clerk to identify items to add or delete, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Your Worship. So I'll just have you mute yourself again. Great, right. thank you, Your Worship. So the only item to add is an HR matter under um, closed session, and it will be a verbal report from the CAO. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Then a motion then that the agenda for the committee of the whole meeting held on July 12, 2021, be confirmed to circulate. A mover and seconder, please. Councilor Foster, Councilor Noel, thank you. All in favor. Thank you. Procure your interest at this time. If you have one, claim it now. If not, when the item comes up. Somebody got a dog? <laughs> I'll go. I'll go to the clerk to identify items for separate discussion and the reasons thereof, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Your Worship. So we have um, two presentations. So the first one is uh, CW42 Water Wastewater Billing and Collection Bylaw Update. There will be a presentation from staff. We also have a CW54 cannabis production in the town of New Tecumseh. Uh, there's a staff presentation as well. We have six deputations that have registered. And lastly, we have uh, two closed session reports. They're both verbal reports from the CAO. The first concerns um, the water supply from Collingwood and the second um, concerns an HR matter. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I'll go to council to identify items for separate discussion. Councilor Sainsbury. Thank you, Your Worship. Item CW51 and CW56, please. Councilor McClellan. Thank you, Worship. Uh, CW52, please. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, I'll go back to a clerk to summarize all items identified for separate discussion. I'll just have you meet yourself again, Your Worship. Sorry. Thank you, Your Worship. So the items for separate discussion are CW42, Water, Wastewater Billing and Collection Bylaw Update. Staff have a presentation. CW51, uh, 2038 148 Ontario Incorporated, Cable Bridge Enterprises Limited, Construction of 14th Line Water Booster Station. CW52, award of P21-07, Consulting Services for Drainage Master Plan, Phase 2, Flood Mitigation Municipal Class Environmental Assessment Study. CW54, Cannabis Production in the Town of New Tecumseh. There's a staff presentation as well as six deputations. CW56, Alliston uh, Hornets Hockey Club Rental Agreement, and CS1 and CS2. CS1 is a verbal report of the CAO and town solicitor regarding the water supply from Collingwood and CS2, which was an added item, is an HR matter, and that will be a verbal report from the CAO. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Then a mover and second that all items not identified for separate discussion be received and a recommendation therein be re recommended to council for adoption. Moved by Councilor Foster, second by Councilor Lacey. 
All in favor? Carried, thank you. First item is CW42. We'll go to uh, we'll go to Allison to uh, to do her presentation. Allison. Okay. Thanks, Barb. Good evening, Your Worship and members of council. My name is Allison Gallant. I'm the manager of financial services for the town, and I'm here to give you a bit of information and some context surrounding our water and wastewater billing and collection bylaw update. Next slide, please. Um, we had to take several factors into consideration when drafting this update. The first one being the fact that our existing bylaw was enacted back in March of 1999 and really doesn't meet the town's needs from a process perspective, and it doesn't reflect uh, best practices of municipalities. The town has seen significant growth uh, over the past several years, particularly on the residential sector, and we have seen that property owners' needs have evolved over time as a result of that. We've had several legislation changes over the years that need to be incorporated into the bylaw. For example, privacy legislation now dictates what we can and cannot say and what information we can and cannot provide. Um, and in addition to that, we now can treat utility bills as having priority lien status, which means that they can be collected in the same manner as taxes. So as a result of that, when we have a delinquent account, we can transfer it directly to the property tax roll. The town itself has invested in technology over the last several years that have uh, offered us some advances in our ability to process the bills and also offered some automation in terms of communication. The current bylaw references hand delivering certain notices and shutting the water off due to non-payment those are options we really don't take advantage of and don't need to with the legislation the way it is. The other thing we've noticed is that in the current bylaw, there are some fees that were hard coded in that bylaw and really haven't kept up with the pace of inflation. So we've removed those bylaws from the draft and our plan is to maintain those as part of the consolidated fees and charges bylaw. Finally, the other thing we've taken into consideration is some frustration that we've seen on behalf of the property owners. They're often not aware of the legislation and the fees that can be imposed with tenant account changes. Um, the calls to staff are typically pretty lengthy. The owners are very frustrated and their frustration tends to escalate when they're made aware that staff is really limited in their ability to solve issues of that respect. Um, and in turn, that causes a lot of frustration for staff as well. Next slide, please. So in order to make a change in this area, we wanted to solicit some feedback before we did anything. We sent a survey to 10% of the property owners that have tenanted accounts. Our objective was to gauge insight into their understanding of our current practices, as well as our fees and, our, and the legislation to determine their satisfaction with the process as well. Overall, the response rate we received was 58%. The results from the survey made it apparent that the property owners really didn't have a good understanding of the circumstances and the fees they could face when they're transferring an account to a tenant's name. Next slide, please. In addition to the survey, we did some comparisons with 10 other municipalities to evaluate their processes compared to our current bylaw. And we found that the majority of them do not allow tenant accounts and have already gone through the transition that we're currently proposing. Next slide, please. The updated bylaw, a draft of which has been included with your report, stipulates now that the account should be maintained in the property owner's name. That ultimately will result in complete transparency and account awareness to the property owners. And it also will result in them incurring fewer fees because they won't be transferring between tenant names. Our system functionality has improved our means of correspondence distribution 
And these timelines have been set in the new bylaw. In addition to that, um, we're now able to offer electronic billing, which allows property owners to forward the bills directly to the tenants if they so choose. We've also added some clarification on water, sh water shutoff, which would really only be used in an extreme situation. Um, we will also be promoting the ease of electronic account monitoring. We have an electronic platform called Virtual Town Hall, which should help the property owners in that it gives them information on a real-time basis. They'll be able to see their utility account balances at any point in time. Finally, the updated bylaw should allow staff to refocus their efforts on other customer service measures and on managing their time more efficiently. Next slide, please. So we've implemented a, a communi communication plan that will take effect immediately after the passage of the bylaw. Um, over the next six months, we will be inserting a Q&A style insert into all the mailings and sending it to the landlords as well. And we will also be updating the town's FAQs on our website. In the last bill, the tenants and the landlords will also get a separate insert um, outlining what they'll be able to expect as the transfer commences. Next slide, please. Our final step in the process will be the implementation, which again will take effect immediately after the bylaw passage. So once the bylaw is passed, accounts will no longer be transferred into a tenant's name. Um, we will begin the communication process with tenants to say they'll receive their final bill. Um, that will be between October and December. There will be a note on the bills to confirm to them this is the final bill you'll receive. If we have a deposit on file for that tenant, it will be refunded. And going forward, starting in January 2022, the landlords can expect to receive their first bill. There will be no final fees or no activation fees billed as part of this transition. So that concludes the information I'm going to provide today. I just want to finish by saying we will certainly be working with the landlords through this transition should they have any questions or concerns. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Manager Galan. Questions? I'll go to Councillor Foster. Thank you, Mayor Mellon, for you to. Uh... Allison Gallant, um, I think this is a smart move. Um, I, I've had a number of uh, complaints from people and dealt with a, a number of town staff on this. The only thing I would I would question is is the logic. I understand the move going forward to not moving it moving it into into tenants' names because the fact that it is it, you can collect the water bills like you can taxes, but to go and take the tenant names off the bills. So basically go back retroactively and try to correct what's already done. Um, have you thought about the potential uh, implications? Because now instead of having a bill, you're gonna ask a landlord to essentially increase the rent to compensate for the water. That may, that may get some landlords in trouble with the landlord tenant board because you can't arbitrarily raise rents outside of the fixed rate increase from the, um, from the provincial government that comes out yearly. And so if you have a cooperative tenant, it's all good. But I, I see some issues with taking the ones that are already uh, in good standing and then moving them back to the, uh, to the landlord. So maybe your thoughts about that or, or has that even, has that been given due consideration? Manager Gallant. Through you, Mayor Milne, to Councillor Foster, we have given that some consideration. Um, we talked about it quite a bit. Um, we did. We did have some concerns with maintaining it the way it is. For one, one of the concerns we have is we do have deposits on file for those existing tenants, but because it's been at a, a rate that was set in 1999. It's not enough to cover the cost of a bill should anyone default on their account. We also find it difficult to act as a mediator in those situations. Historically, we have found that landlords will call us and their expectation is that we resolve the issue with the tenant. And it really hasn't been something we could do. It's not practical for us. And those are the cases where the landlords tend to get very frustrated. Those issues get escalated. 
So I guess to sum it up, we haven't, we haven't found a practical way to do that. We felt it was, it was a little bit better to just draw a line and switch everything and make it a clean transition. Councillor Foster. Uh, thank you. Supplementary. I'm not suggesting for one second that uh, you don't, that we don't move this forward. I think it's a great idea. And I think it will, for all the reasons you've stated above, I'm just thinking to myself, if you take, Take a, take a tenant in good standing who's been paying the water bill on behalf of their landlord and all of a sudden they receive a notice from the town that says final bill. And then the landlord, say the water bill is 100 bucks every three months or whatever quarter it comes out. And the landlord then says to the tenant, okay, I need $100 from you. And at the end of the day, I, I guess my only comment would be is that the landlord tenant board is a very stringent board to deal with. I would just respectfully suggest that maybe we get an opinion from them on taking the ones that are already in place and moving them out so as not to put some unnecessary burden on, on a landlord. I don't want you to, the municipality to be a facilitator nor deal with inept landlords that can't deal with their tenants. That's not our problem. I just want to make sure we're, we're just not compounding the problem because of the transfer process. That's my only comment for you to consider. Thank you. Any other questions for the manager? Okay, I have a motion then. Look for his mover and seconder that the presentation of uh, Allison Grant, manager of financial service be received and further under bylaw number 99-38, water sewer billing and collection bylaw be, re be repealed and replaced with the water, wastewater billing collection bylaw being attached for number one to report of FIN 2021-20. Moved by Councillor Foster, seconded by Councillor Beattie. All in favor? Carried, thank you. Thank you, uh, Manager Galan. Thank you. Next one is CW51, uh, Councillor Sainsbury. Uh, thank you, Worship. Through you to Director Battery. Uh, could you please tell me the total number of units in phase four related to this booster pump station? Director Battery. Through your worship to Councillor Sainsbury, I believe that number is 311 units in phase four. Okay. Uh, this, and this booster pump station would also then supply additional flows to the future phases in, in the treetop subdivision. Oh, it's that was just, my second. Yeah, that was my supplementary was, will it do phase five and six, which is commercial and the 55 remnant parcel? So it will cover everything that has been approved, just waiting with the letter H on it till we resolve the water. Right. Okay, and my other question was, um, that when this is initiated, one paragraph says the construction completion and commissioning will be at the 250th building permit. You go down to the next paragraph, it says um, R3, schedule R3 of phase four of the subdivision development, turns over the page and says, the agreement to enter into an external servicing agreement to construct the water booster station on the 14th line prior to applying for the 180th building permit for phase four. So is it 180 when they start and it must be completed by the 250th? Director or Battery. Actually, those numbers both be 250 or 180. Director Battery. Through your worship to Councillor Sainsbury, there are two separate triggers. The first one at 180 is that they enter into the agreement. And then the second trigger is that the, sub, the works be substantially complete prior to the issuance of the 250th building permit. Okay, because I read it after. So if the 180 paragraph had been ahead and then the 250 okay. after. They wouldn't, I guess, need to be clarified, but thank you for your help. Any other questions from council? Okay, look for a mover and second or the reporting 2021-22 be received and further that a bylaw be enacted to authorize the mayor clerk to enter into external service and agreement with 2038148 Ontario Inc. Cable Bridge Enterprise Limited to facilitate the construction of the 14th line water booster station in the community of Alliston, subsequently in form of attachment number three to an engineer report of Ing 2021-22, all subject to town solicitor's final clear. Moved by uh, Councillor Noah, second by Councillor Foster, all in favor? Carried, thank you. CW52, 
uh, Councillor uh, McClellan. Oh, thank you, Worship. Just a quick question to Director Vatry. So this is phase two of our drainage master plan. Will this be the phase that identifies any works that may possibly be done? And will it be phase three that actually implements the findings from phase two? I just didn't know if you could uh, clarify that for me. Director Vatry. Through your worship to Councillor McClung. Yes, this phase will, as part of the final modeling, I also identify projects that could be implemented by the town to improve drainage in the area. And you're correct, as part of future or phase three of the program or future capital programs, we would then start implementing some of those works as time goes on. Uh, Deputy Mayor Norcliffe. Uh, thank you, your worship. Forgive me, but I just can't see a, com a timeline completion and the report and when the works are to be done. If the director could uh, enlighten me, please. Director Battery. Um, through your worship to the deputy mayor, um, as part of the funding program here, we're to have the report substantially complete by March 31st, and that's for the funding portion. Not to say the project or the report couldn't be presented to council after, but that's when the majority of the work needs to be done to be eligible for the funding. And these future works then would take place at council's discretion with respect to capital projects. Okay, thank you. Good. Any other questions? All right, sit back and relax. Uh, recommend a report in 2021-26 be received and serves that the RFP of P21-07 be awarded to the Matrix Solution Inc for the drainage master plan phase two flood mitigation municipal class environmental assessment study in accordance with the proposed date of June 25th, 2021 for the upset fee of $639,962 plus applicable taxes. And further that a project consists in the allowance in the amount of $64,000 plus HST be approved for the project to be administered in spirit of keeping with section two of the capital project administration and reporting policy. And further that this project be funded from the funds received from the National Disaster Mitigation Program intake number six grant and balance fund by roads and related development charges reserve of 30% and capital projects tax fund reserve of 70%. And further that a bylaw be enacted to authorize the mayor and clerk to enter into agreement with Matrix Solutions Inc. in accordance with the RFP of P2107. And further, that a bylaw be enacted to authorize the mayor and clerk to enter into a transfer payment agreement with the province of Ontario. And further, that the mayor and clerk or their designates be authorized to sign the appropriate documents and agreements respecting the reporting and receiving of payments as part of the National Disaster Mitigation Program Intake, six grant funding. Mover and seconder, please. Moved by Councilor McDonald, second by the Deputy Mayor. All in favor? Carry, thank you. Next is CW54. And uh, we're gonna hear first from uh, our Director of Planning and Building, Jennifer. Uh, Best, uh, Director Best, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Tonight will be a presentation on the cannabis production in the town to accompany the staff report that's before you and to provide a back, uh, summary of the background of a consultant that prepared some information. Next slide, please. To start off with, an interim control bylaw was passed. October 1st, 2020, to provide sufficient time to review and undertake a study on the potential to consider allowing and regulating cannabis operations in the town. Currently, there's a hold on all new planning applications related to cannabis operations in specific zones, this being mostly the agricultural, rural, environmental protection, and those Oak Ridges Moraine uh, agricultural rural zones. This bylaw is set to expire on October 1st, 21. Next slide, please. The Cannabis Act came into force in 2018 from the federal government. There are regulations and licenses required to grow 
sell or process cannabis from Health Canada. However, it is legal for residents to grow up to four plants per residence for personal recreational use. In the federal regulatory regime, there's limited land use regulations with much of the regulations left to the local municipality to deal with. Next slide, please. I wanted to bring your attention to the fact that cannabis could be considered an agricultural use. And in that there is a broad definition of agricultural use and the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture and Food has also supported cannabis being an agricultural use. So the production of cannabis could also be considered an agricultural related use, which is farm related commercial industrial uses that are directly related to farm operations in the area. Our town zoning bylaw defines all cannabis operations as a medical marijuana production facility. And this has been used for defining all related cannabis operations, including for, uh, for medical purposes, cultivating and processing of cannabis. But municipalities can regulate cannabis related land uses as, as demonstrated here, similar to other land uses. And licenses are still required, but license holders are required to comply with local zoning controls. Next slide, please. So the town has an official plan that sets out our land use designations and we have a zoning bylaw that's aligned to our official plan. It kind of breaks down those uses and performance standards in more detail. So if, if it's determined that cannabis is an agriculture or agriculture related use, then it would be permitted in the agricultural, rural, Oak Ridge's Marine, countryside and natural linkage area designations and their corresponding zones. There's a unique situation for our mineral aggregate resources and extractive industrial that does permit agricultural uses. In the employment and industrial designations and zones, manufacturing, processing and warehousing is permitted. This could also include cannabis production. So note that, as I mentioned before, the, the medical marijuana production facility, it is permitted in our employment area one and two and the, in the urban industrial zone. I wanted to bring this to your attention because as we move through the process on dealing with cannabis, these are things that you need to consider as part of looking at any regulatory controls. Next slide, please. The planning partnership was retained by the town to undertake a jurisdictional scan of Ontario municipalities, as well as provide background information, which is attached to the staff report. They studied 11 municipalities on their approach to regulating cannabis. Cannabis uses were either agricultural use or industrial use in the official plan and zoning bylaw. This one is some of the main conclusions that were found from planning partnership. Outdoor cultivation of cannabis was only permitted in agricultural or rural zones. Cannabis growing, grow under processed employment zones had to be located in an enclosed building. Next slide, please. As part of the SCAN planning partnership also looked at what regulatory controls were uh, produced by these municipalities and their zoning bylaws and official plans. And the summary of these are minimum setbacks were required from cannabis uses to other land uses, lots in certain zones. The setbacks ranged from about 50 meters to 300 meters with 150 and 300 meters appearing most often. There were required setbacks, um, distances between buildings as part of a cannabis operation. There is a requirement for a security fence around the premises that actually in some cases require the same setbacks as the facilities themselves. A municipality has also prohibited the use of temporary structures, including hoop greenhouses for cannabis cultivation. Loading spaces, again, were enclosed in a building. Site plan control was required in many instances to address site matters to help uh, mitigate nuisance concerns. Mitigation measures included required studies for things like light, odor, dust, transportation, water. There was the prohibited uh, prohibition of retail stores and sales, as well as dwellings on the same property as a cannabis operation. And clear definitions of cannabis uses were provided. And in some cases, municipalities updated existing definitions, such as an agricultural or industrial use, to either include or exclude cannabis uses. Next slide, please. Planning Partnerships program team also launched an online survey in the winter of 2021 with 264 participants, of which 94% were town residents. 
One of the questions was providing input and ranking the top five concerns with regards to cannabis production. And before you, the top five being odor, effect on property values, ease of approvals, enjoyment of property and compatibility in agricultural areas. Another question related to if cannabis was permitted, what regulatory mechanisms were most appropriate? From that, locating outdoor cannabis cultivation away from sensitive uses and property lines, indoor cannabis cultivation and processing, it was most suitable in industrial use with setbacks from sensitive uses. There were several other suggestions, including limiting the size of the operation based upon the property size. The full responses are found in the attachment to the staff report. Next slide, please. So, uh, so tonight, as I mentioned, this was about providing the first round of the study results from the planning partnership and providing many more opportunities for discussion. So it's planned that for July 26, the regulatory zoning options will be developed by planning partnership and presented committee of the whole. May have been an error in the report that it was to council, but it was meant to be committee of the whole. A statutory public meeting would be held in August on proposed cannabis zoning provisions and subsequently a recommendation and draft zoning bylaw amendment presented to committee for their consideration, followed then by a zoning bylaw amendment prepared for approval. October 1st is the uh, interim control bylaw expires. So if no zoning bylaw amendments passed, the previous zone provisions stand. If the zoning bylaw is appealed, then it's heard at the Ontario Land Tribunal, which is the new name for the LPAT, which was then the OMB. And the interim control by law provisions remain in effect until a decision is made at the tribunal. If council extends the interim control by law up to an additional year, it is also subject to appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Director. This time we have uh, several people who wish to participate in this meeting. And the first one we'll call, uh, Barb, will you invite Reva in, please? Okay, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, okay, Reva, can you turn your camera and mic on, please? I believe my microphone is on. Can you yes, hear me? Is. Yes, and we can see you. Okay, good. <laughs> um, lots of years ago, we bought this house and we've been enjoying the house. And the last few years, it's really been horrible. I know nobody in the other meetings that I, I've listened to have lived here. So they can't tell the smell that we have. It is horrible. You cannot sit outside. Unfortunately for me, I am asthmatic, which makes it even worse. Um, perhaps somebody should have done their homework to find out the kind of people that are, are living here, that we like to enjoy our life. And we can't do that anymore with the smell. And, you know, the fact that um, at the beginning, we were told that there's 1,400 plants or 1,800 plants for four people uh, for their personal use. That to me seems a little bit extreme. I don't know enough about it, but it just seems a lot. Uh, I wish somebody would have done something before to stop them from doing this. I know it's a big corporation, but you know what? We are people. And we do live here. We pay our tax. We do everything. I don't want to know that I have to sell my house for less money because I have to tell people there's a grow up down the road. And yes, that's the smell that you smell. Who's going to buy a house here? Nobody is going to. It is horrible. I wish somebody could come here and just sit outside and get the aroma. Um, I know Priestley Construction, they have a lot of finances behind them, but I don't know. I think I'm worth more than Priestley making money 
on so-called medicinal cannabis. I, you know, I, it's very, very upsetting. We love our house. We love living here. I don't want to move from here because of the smell. And I really don't think it's fair. Um, we did our investigating when we bought the house. Perhaps that's what Priestley should have done. And they didn't do it. That's about all I have to say. Thank you very much, Mrs. Bernstein. Uh, we feel your compassion, definitely. Any questions to this young lady? Mr. Harrison McIntyre. Thank you, Your Worship. And thank you, uh, Ms. Brownstein, for coming and speaking to council. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, she's referring to the fifth line and the, um, the illegal operation that's happening there on the fifth line. Um, and just to be clear, there's, and, and this will come up in tonight's meeting, but there is the difference between licenses and prescriptions. And what we have in this case is somebody who has a medical prescription um, combined with a number of other prescriptions and they're using that loophole to be able to have this grow up. So that's the kind of um, stuff that we're up against. Um, and I think that tonight we're going to sort through this, but it's a lot to, to, to sort out um, and figure out what is uh, what we have control over, what we don't have control over. My question to you, Mrs. Brownstein, is um, I know where you're located. I know where they're located. Do you have any sense of how many meters that might be away? Because you would be no a good clue. indication. Okay. No. Yeah, I can't, I can't do that either. I can't figure that one out. But it would be good to be able to say, um, to be able to give an example, of, like to say like, this is why we need the larger buffer area, the larger uh, distance separation, because you can be this many meters away. Um, I'm sure that that's something that we could probably figure out though. Yeah, well, there are people that live right across the street. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not the and only- And I know, at, oh, no, no, no. You're not, I've, I've heard from lots of people, but again, yeah. I guess what I'm trying to say is that you can live not beside them and not across the street and you can still uh, it still is negatively impacting your on your, the enjoyment of your property. So to try and figure out how big, big that that odor, how how far that odor is spreading, would be good information for us to have. And as well, um, when council goes to vote on if we do decide to um, put in place some sort of provisions, the larger the buffer, I think the more positive that will be for the residents who um, who might be close by. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Bronson. Thank you. Uh, Mark, you had Giuseppe Leonardo? Yes, Your Worship, we're just letting him in. So next speaker is Giuseppe Leonardo. How are you? Good evening, you hear me? Good evening Good. sir. Good evening. You, you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Oh, perfect. Okay, uh, I'm just. I have a few things I just want to say. It's regarding the the fact that cannabis is considered an agricultural operation. It's considered that with Omafra. It's considered that with the PPS. It's considered that with federal government. It's it's an agricultural use, and it's it's not going to go away. Uh, number two, I have here is that. Council is in place to pretty much govern and regulate the PPS and the OMAFRA and federal laws. It's pretty much by what's happening right now with the council and with all these restrictions, it's not helping the it's not helping the citizens of the town. It's not helping people that want to get into cannabis legally. It's actually putting a negative impact on all that because people that are getting into the cannabis industry right now in the town of Tecumseh are doing it all completely illegal. They're not coming to town for uh, approvals. They're not coming for bylaws. They're not, they're not following the official plan. They're not doing anything that will benefit the community or anything else besides that. Uh, number four I have here is that
Uh, the bylaw that the town has in place right now isn't a bylaw. Uh, the bylaw that you guys have, it's, it's stating medical marijuana for the purpose of uh, pretty much it's that bylaw states that it is all medical use. That medical marijuana doesn't exist anymore. That bylaw was, or that medical, the MMPR was enacted in 2014 by the federal government, which was stated that it was unconstitutional to the person with a license to grow cannabis. So that doesn't exist. Bottom line, the the town has no bylaw to restrict anything in the area right now. So it's not benefiting anybody in the town. So people can pop them up 50 feet, 20 feet, 35 feet. And it's, it's just going to be, uh, I can tell you a, a circus because they're just going to do it. And then you try to shut them down and it's going to go appeals and appeals and appeals and appeals. Number five I have on my list is that the, the committee by doing what they're doing now and pretty much telling everybody that you can't do this. It's like, that is promoting black market cannabis. And that's what the government is trying not to do. They're trying to get everybody that's in the black market off the streets, get licensed by Health Canada, regulated by Canada Revenue, and operate a legitimate business. Number six, I have here states that if the town does want to put a bylaw into place, they should, which they should put a bylaw into place. It's majority would be on zonings. And like the, the planner said, it would be location, setbacks, and obviously no, no dwelling on the property. That would eliminate a lot of people from getting into the industry in that area and being further away from actual residents that live in that area. So there would be no problems with that. As you guys can take my, my property as example, uh, I'm on the, the 11th line and I've been operating since September 9th, 2020. And I've had no complaints. I have a house that's about 350 meters away from me, if not 400 meters. And he has heard no complaints from me, no smell, no odor, no nothing. Uh, we don't run generators at night. I don't have my equipment outside. So it's uh, taking the smell out of my system and dumping it into the air. Everything's completely enclosed. I like to run a clean operation. And I'm also very respectful to all my neighbors. Seven. Yeah. My property would be pretty much a great candidate to you and how far away from dwellings, daycares, sensitive land uses, options. It would also save appeals and a lot of complaints from all residents in the area. Number eight states here that uh, people getting into bad people. We're just looking to make an honest living. Obviously, we're regulated by Health Canada and Canada Revenue. So there's not like we're showing up to our sites. We have AK-47s and we have a bunch of people just coming in and out. And we're selling drugs on the street and we're giving them to kids and all that type of stuff. It's not like that. People that are in the legal cannabis industry just want to make an honest living just like any other potato farmer, sod farmer, cultivator of flowers, and, and anyone in the legitimate world, that's exactly what we do. We just look to make an honest living. Uh, that's, that's pretty much all I have to say. Like our property, my property would be a great example for what we can do to help the town. And what I did from the beginning wasn't that I was trying to find a loophole. I wasn't trying to be, pardon my language, an asshole. I was just looking to put a bylaw in place with Mr. Rabbits and Hoppy so we can regulate anybody else coming into the industry so they wouldn't be affecting the people of the town. That's, that was the whole point of me applying my, my bylaw and doing going for all my rezonings and all that. And obviously, we know the first person through the wall always gets bloody. So I'm, I'm good with that. I'm fine. 
I'm still here working with the committee. I'm still here working with the council. And I just want to put something in place. So there is number one, so I can run an honest business. And number two, so that the people of the town of New Tecumseh so can be protected from guys that just want to pop up illegal grow ops. Yeah, 30 and seconds just, is that me. Yeah. And people that pop up illegal grow ops and pretty much cause a nuisance to everyone else in the town. That's pretty much all I have to say, sir. I thank, thank you, you very much for, my, for your time. Thank you very much. Any questions to the... Thanks again. Uh, Our next presenter. Not a problem. Just one more. I just have to move Mr. Giuseppe back into the... Or sorry. Just a few Leonardo back into the uh, attendee room. Okay, so through your worship, uh, Canvi uh, Badara has not shown up, so we're going to move to the next person on the list, which is Guy Bonnie. Okay. So I'm just going to bring him in. Mr. Bonnie, if you can turn your mic and camera on, please. Hello, am I on here? Oh, now yeah. Right. Um, You're on, Kai. My uh, my wife is actually um, excuse me here for a second. My uh, my wife is actually on to speak, and I wondered if we could actually have Susan speak first. Certainly, you both have seven minutes, so whoever wants to speak first. Okay, Susan. Okay. I think it, it's always it's always smart to let the wife speak first. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, I live at uh, 7181 Third Line, and I'm just here tonight to express my concerns with the background uh, report that is before Council in regard to cannabis production operations and the agricultural resources. My family and I have been living beside one of these illegal operations that was built on agricultural resources for almost four years. There are numerous negative impacts that come with cannabis production operations. Just to name a few, we've experienced some uh, physical health issues, the noise and the extreme odor. We have heard that there are engineering solutions to deal with extreme odor, but know for a fact that these solutions do not work and that it is virtually impossible to mitigate these problems in agricultural areas. In reading the report before you, I, it would appear to suggest that cannabis production operations should take place on agricultural resources. If council is to move forward with allowing this use on agricultural resources, every rural resident in this town is at risk of feeling the extreme impacts, which I have experienced firsthand for almost four years. The town has a responsibility to ensure the use of land including agriculture, is aligned with the requirements of the Planning Act and the provincial policy. The reports before you are blindly accepting the Ministry of Agriculture's opinion, stating that cannabis is a crop. And many, of, and many in this province know this opinion is not aligned with provincial policy. Municipalities and provincial ministers, such as the Ministry of Agriculture, are bound by the Planning Act to align their decisions with the policies and it is irresponsible for any government authority to make any decision that is based on information that is not in alignment with policies of the province. I encourage council to challenge OMAFRA's irresponsible opinion that suggests cannabis is a crop. Planners addressing this matter should also live by their code of ethics and disregard this opinion and research the planning act and provincial policies sufficiently to make it known that agricultural resources are to be managed for the production of food and fiber. It's in the town's, it is the town's responsibility to lead this challenge and ensure that all land use decisions are aligned with the Planning Act and pro provincial policies. This report is based on OMAFRA's opinion that cannabis is a crop, not on the provincial policies. I encourage council to take the appropriate time needed to make a well-informed decision on the use of agricultural resources, knowing that if a wrong decision is made, it will have a negative lifelong impact on all the rural residents of this town. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Okay. 
Good evening, Council. Uh, Barb, I wondered if you might uh, put slide 13 up. Um, I'm just going to leave that one up for the uh, for the entire my discussion here. Okay, well, just one moment. And when it's up, I'll start. <clears throat> I don't know if you could make it a little bit uh, larger there. Um, that might be a little bit better. Uh, okay, um, cannabis production problems are not new in the town. The town dealt with this situation when the access to cannabis medical per for medical purpose and regulations were put in place by the federal government. Cannabis production operations started popping up then, no, different, no differently than they are today. The town enacted regulations restricting the use to industrial areas, and this response provided the best level of control to mitigate the many intrusive and nasty impacts associated with this activity. The statements in the Planning Act, the provincial policy governing the appropriate use of agricultural resources are the same today as they were in back when the legislation was put in for medical purposes. The provincial government has consistently promoted the wise and responsible use of agricultural resources in Ontario for 30 or more years. Provincial policy explicitly states agricultural resources are to be managed for the production of food and fiber. Marijuana production and processing is not connected in any way to food and fiber production, so it suffices to say that this activity must not allow the that must not be allowed to occupy Ontario's valuable agricultural resources. The reports and draft discussion document that are before you tonight include statements that are not aligned with the wording in part four of the provincial policy. The staff reports highlight other municipal best practices that are new and have never been disputed, nor have they been around long enough to even know they are effective. The best practice Examples were all based on a, the opinion of the Minister of Agriculture that is not aligned with provincial policy. Cases brought before the local planning appeal authority have been settled without dispute. And this means part four of the provincial policy that states agricultural resources are to be managed for production of food and fiber has never been brought forward for discussion in any dispute. We are in contact with many of the folks impacted by the results of the noted LPAT hearings and all are saying they are worse off today than they were before the hearings. The sensitive use setbacks noted in the range of 50 to 300 meters were established in desperation without scientific investigation. They were essentially pulled from a hat during discussions between Nor a Norfolk planner and the Ministry of Ag. Based in discussions on matters related to the actions of other municipalities making poorly informed decisions or incomplete information about undisputed LPAC cases or information pulled from a hat during discussions between parties that are not the best qualified to address environmental matters is like one sheep following another off a cliff. It is the municipality's jurisdiction to oversee all the land use decisions, including ensuring agricultural uses are aligned with provincial policy, requiring agricultural resources managed for the production of food and fiber. The, report, the reports before council tonight were developed without complete review and reference to the entire policy document. The foundation of the reports is based on a flawed understanding of provincial policy connected to managing agricultural resources. Cannabis production and processing stems from federal laws and regulations that are not living up to their purpose and are not likely to change for, the, for years. Provincial ministry opinions are not aligned with provincial policy. The activity is severely impacting folks across this province and it includes so many in this town. The activity has so many unknowns associated with it that it requires far more investigation and discussion than appears in the report and draft document staff have presented tonight. I respectfully request council find the reports before you to be incomplete and insufficient for you to understand this matter sufficiently. And we ask that you instruct staff to fully consider the information we in the community are presenting to you tonight. 
I provided council members with a document today that should help you on all understand the municipality's role in taking the lead to solve the land use matter. And it will guide you down a path to understanding, understanding once OMAFRA's opinion is, is aligned with provincial policy, they will not have a role to play in determining where the activity can take, can take place. The information will help you make an informed decision and I encourage you to read and ask questions. Thank you for hearing our concerns and we look forward to cannabis production and processing uses remaining in the industrial area of this municipality. Thank you very much, Guy. Uh, any questions to Guy and Council at this time? Councillor Jeff? Oh, thank you. I, didn't, I couldn't find my cards. Um, uh, through you, Your Worship, to Mr. Bonney, you provided us a map of our of our municipality and in the south in Ward 7, there's quite a few like the 10 acre lot, lots that were, were provided back, I think in the 70s. And we have properties, farmers that will sever off a piece of property because it's excess of dwelling or it's not required in their operation. Um, can you speak to what are your thoughts? I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on that with these lots that are being created whenever uh, property gets severed off. Well, tra traditionally, uh, if you start out with your 100 acre parcel, farm parcel originally, um, and you request a severance to come off those properties, um, in order to get it out of agricultural resources, um, the, the property, the lot that you're creating must be um, considered um, um, not agricultural lands, um, surplus to agricultural uses. So any, any, any of the lots in, in anywhere in New Tecumseh, for that matter, in any municipality that have been taken out of, uh, out of agriculture are essentially become residential lots, rural residential lots. So, uh, and that's, primarily the only real use that could ever take place on these lots. So they could never, never be um, anything other than residential in a, in a rural setting like that. Um, when you look at um, New Tecumseh and basically Ward 7, there's, there are two rural wards, or Ward 5 and Ward 7. Um, the pop property density, I would call it, in Ward 7 is significant. And I would suggest that if you if you locate a marijuana operation anywhere in Ward Seven, I would say for sure, uh, they're all going to be impacted by any kind of uh, marijuana operation from the odor, the noise, and the light. Um, and and you have, you know, they're not huge um, lots in the Ward Five either, uh, especially compared to Southern Ontario, where you might have two, three, four hundred, six hundred acre farms or a thousand acre farms. So. Um, you know, I, I don't see this, I don't see this use ever taking place outside of the industrial area in this municipality, uh, primarily because, you know, in agricultural areas, uh, the Ministry of Environment and Conservation of Parks has really no jurisdiction. They rely on the Ag Ministry of Ag. And uh, in order to control noise, odor, and all the impacts that follow this use, um, you really need the help of the MECP so they can, you know, if they don't follow the rules, they, they can always shut these operations down immediately. Hopefully that answers your, answer your question. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Guy. Thank you, Mr. Milne. Uh, your next part. Thank you, Your Worship. We're just going to let in uh, Jean-Yves. Mr. Payne, can you turn your camera and your mic on, please? Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jean Iverbain. Uh, I'm the owner of a 100 acre land. I'm one in the neighbor of Rita. Uh, let's address a few questions before I start the presentation per se. 
Question was asked, how far Rita is from the cannabis facility on the fifth line? It's 625 meters. Um, in my case, I'm 480. Rita is on the east side, I'm on the west side. Um, but a question that was asked, um, or indirectly was, the size of the lot was the impact of cannabis facility. The facility on the fifth line, because I took the time to look at within 1.5 kilometers around that property is uh, around 250, 275 property. So that gives you an, an idea of how many people can be impacted. Now let's start the discussing about the document you have. Uh, you have here from Susan and Guy, and I, I'm not going to rehash what they say. I agree with what they, they have said. Uh, but I'm going to be more, more speaking about a little bit more in the detail of the document that you have in hand. Um, I have submitted a document uh, this afternoon for the planning department so they can use it to uh, amend or improve the document per se. Uh, but I will raise a few of the subjects that I, I don't like or need to, need to be improved, we can put it that way. Uh, Class of license in section 3.1. A reader who doesn't know the regulation, did not take the time to re read the regulation, will not understand that there is two level or two type of permit. There is a license one and there is a registration one. And they're different in terms of regulation, in terms of what they have to do to be able to obtain the license, the number of plants that they have, uh, how they control odors, Nice and they are obliged to control orders, registered, and they have no requirement. And also the role in municipality is also different. So it should be different section for those, for those two to be able to better explain so the reader better understand. Um, also in section four, um, was really the role of municipality in the federal licensing uh, process there is one document that has been issued by the Health Canada last spring, which is called the, health, uh, the Draft Guidelines on Personal Products of Cannabis uh, for Medical Purpose. That's a document you have reviewed. That's a document you have provided a, a letter to, the, to Health Canada to say you have concern. Same thing in my case, I, have, I did a presentation to, to your committee, to your council. Uh, that same document should be also reviewed in this report because it's just an important document. It's just, yes, it is a draft, but at least give you a sense of what the federal would like to do, even the regulation is not saying that, but that gives you still a sense. Um, going a little bit further down, section 4.1. 4 uh, there is a statement which is wrong in the document related to order control. There is, it's just, if I read the document, the regulation also required that all buildings be equipped with a system that filter the air to prevent escape of odors. That statement is wrong. The license facility, because the license facility, yes, it is true. No question about it. The registered facility, it does not require in the regulation. A lot of people would like to have it. The draft guidelines that the uh, Health Canada has produced, I think they recommend, but in the regulation, it's not a requirement. So need to be changed. Uh, sec section 5.1.2, uh, the, the, the consultant who did the uh, prepared that report, did an interpretation of the, uh, the provincial policy statement related to major facility. They're saying that uh, cannabis facility is not included because it's not in the example. Uh, but they also, the example say it's just, it's just not a full list. It's just, just a few high time they know that they have concern, but they can be a lot more. In my case, because of the impact, the environmental impact, odor, noise, uh, lighting, 
that the cannabis facility can have or can be happening in traffic. For me, the, and the impact on the neighbors, they are a major facility for me. So they are in. And if I look at the different criteria, criteria it's loss in property value, uh, interference for normal business of the neighbors, uh, discomfort of the neighbors, loss of enjoyment, impair the quality of natural environment. They all click, 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 click. So they, they all meet you know, those requirements. So let's go a little bit further. Uh, section 5.1.2, distance, uh, distance of off, uh, uh, offense can be, they more or less say in that section that, or oh, you need buffer to be able to reduce the impact. You need more than just buffer. You have in hand a, a order report that was produced for the fifth line. And if you read it properly, you're gonna see very well that even with an order management system, they claim 95%, even I would disagree with what they have, they will meet 95%, but even with 95%, they will have impact up to 300 meters. So start to think of a facility that have no order scrubbers. The 300 meter go away and now we are, we're more speaking of a thousand or 1500 meters. You have 30 seconds, John. Uh, yep. Speaking about buffer, yes, it's just a number coming out from the hat of somebody. You have to do it the proper way. The proper way is another study looking at the impact and the configuration of the facility. Best practice, the town of Pillingham have to be looked at. It's just not in the report. They have a beautiful uh, uh, planning act to deal specifically for cannabis. And you should read it. You should probably even copy it. Uh, have provided the information to your planning department, even the contact person at the, uh, from that uh, municipality. Thank you, John. Thank you. Any <laughs> questions? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you get another shot at it again. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have a few other shots, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't use the word shot. <laughs> You have an we'll have some question. discussion about it. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? To talk? Thanks very much for My your pleasure. input. Today. Thank you. Any questions from council before I read the motion? Hey. Moved by Councilor Jeb, seconded by Councilor Harris and McIntyre. That report of PD 2021 be received. McIntyre. Sorry, Your Worship. Yeah, for sure. I definitely have questions um, before we pass the motion. Oh, I asked. I know. I was too. I was writing something down. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I had my card up. <laughs> Can I go now? Your oh, Worship? Everybody's got their cards up now. <laughs> go we ahead. Just... I'm... Okay. So. Um, it would be good to get some clarity around this cannabis um, where it says that it, it could be agricultural. And um, this reminds me of the fill bylaw where we had, where the fill, where we had guidelines from the province. Um, perhaps we can get a little bit of clarity. I don't know if that's from, you know, Colleen or from Ms. Best again, but um, why is this so wishy-washy? who really should be making the call on whether this is um, agricultural or not? Um, is it actually municipality to municipality or shouldn't that be decided at another higher level? And if not, if it's up to us, then I, that would be good information to have as well. Uh, Councillor Jeff. Sorry, I had a question. That was a question to um, oh, consider. Director Beth. Beth, are you a mayor to Councillor Harrison McIntyre? That is something we can look into to get an opinion on if uh, cannabis is food or fiber, as um, asked by uh, Mr. Bonnie. And 
as indicated by a few of your deputants, they are quite correct that um, the ministry, uh, OMAFRA, Ministry of Agricultural Food and Rural Affairs, has indicated that cannabis is, a, is an agricultural use. And so provincially, that uh, when you read the plans, the provincial policy statement and the um, the growth plan and those types of things in its entirety, you have to look at it from an agricultural lens. Given that there isn't a lot of regulation around cannabis, there's opportunity for the municipality to determine where they think it is appropriate or not. So currently right now you have it as an industrial use. Um, and that ha that's a consideration you have to make is, is it appropriate in the agricultural rural zones? And that's why I raised it in the presentation because that is an issue that has to be discussed amongst council and public. Okay, thank you. Councilor Jeff. Um, I think Jennifer cut out on me at the, at the last. I didn't hear the rest of what she had said. I, I just indicated that that's why in the presentation this evening, I had raised the, uh, the, the issues around agriculture because that is something that council uh, and public need to weigh in on of the appropriateness of where, where or not cannabis operation facilities should be considered. Thank and you. Agriculture is something that is, does need to be vetted further. Thank you. I have a couple of questions, uh, Your Worship. First of all, I just want to uh, reiter reiterate, it's an agricultural crop, not an agricultural use. And whenever it spoke about outdoor cultivation of cannabis, I think that should be of hemp, because I don't think cannabis would be grown in outdoor fields, because you're just asking for trouble, then you'd have no crop left. Um, so I think um, the hemp, the hemp crop is what, what you would cultivate outside and that is used for fiber and they call it a CBD. They don't call it because there is not to be any THC in the plant when they make, when they grow the hemp and um, they use the seed for oil, they crush it just like sunflower seeds, canola oil, it gets crushed. So there is a difference between the hemp and the marijuana, the growing of it outside. Um, the other thing about agricultural crop, and I've stated this before, that poppies are an agricultural crop, but they're not allowed to be grown because of the opiate. And we can thank Emily Murphy, our own Emily Murphy, 1920. She pointed out that these opium dens that were popping up in British Columbia at the time, we were gonna have a problem with them. Fast forward a hundred years and here we have an opiate crisis. So she was pretty forward thinking in that. Um, when Mr. Bonnie, he, I asked him about the, um, the lots that are getting severed off, because they're excess buildings, they're not, they're of no use for agriculture. So they should be more of a residential. And the other thing I was thinking of was that this report, um, it doesn't seem, Mr. Uh, Jean-Yves, uh, I can't remember his last name, Jean-Yves has commented that the letter that we wrote, it should be included in part of this discussion paper, this discussion report. So on July the 26th, if we have an open meeting again, and then we're having a public meeting, um, August, and then September the 12th, we are going to have another committee of the whole to discuss. Will this be the discussion of our options and what has been input in from the public meeting? This is a question through to- um, Director uh, Best. Director Best. Uh, through you, Mayor, to you, Councillor Jeb. The thought is that from the, from the July 26th to this evening and the statutory public meeting, it would come into a staff report and recommendation on the September 13th and a draft zoning bylaw amendment based upon what direction staff has received at that time. 
So it would culminate on the uh, 13th of September. Supplementary, Your Worship? Supplementary. So if we have more concerns or, or other ideas that have come forward at the September, I keep saying, thir is it the 13th? 13th, yeah. yes. Okay, thank you. If we have some more comments or uh, different ideas on September 13th, um, will we then be able to meet that October 1st deadline for the, um, the uh, interim control bylaw? And what could we do if we if we if we couldn't meet that October first? What can we do? Uh, for you, Mayor, to Councillor Jeb, if we cannot meet the deadline, and there's a couple options, Council could extend the interim control bylaw uh, up to another year because you're allowed two years in total, and, and one year would have passed at that point to further study it and gather. Uh, you know, more information and public consultation and, and council discussion. If the no bylaw is passed and there's been no extension to the interim control bylaw, the pre previous zone provisions stand. That's not to say that council couldn't direct a different bylaw at a different time. But the hold that's on the planning applications at this time would... Um, you wouldn't be able to, to stop them anymore. Uh, and that, that hold, which is that interim control bylaw. And that was put in, it's, it's, it's a year to study and come up with options and solutions and, and to pass a bylaw. But you, you lose that protection once the um, interim control bylaw is um, expired. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Sainsbury and then Councilor McClellan. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to Jennifer Best. Um, when you went met with the planning partnership and this report was put together, was our solicitor Colleen Butler present? Because quite a few of these towns, two of them, are at LPAT. We're at one court case and we're at LPAT. But the LPAT doesn't seem to be making any decisions very fast related to this whole issue across Ontario. And it's going to tie up an awful lot of LPAT hearings at great expense to the taxpayers at large. Like we have one on the 11th, which has a different uh, connotation because it's a court case, I believe. The one on the 5th, I think it's on hold because of the interim control bylaw. And the one on the third line um, is before LPAT. So I'm, I'm concerned that they're going every which way to get different opinions and an end result that may not be the same at all for all three issues. So that was one of my concerns. And my second concern was uh, from the reports with the different towns that were used uh, as examples by the planning partnership, um, can staff take the best out of each one of those um, bylaws for those towns and work with Colleen Butler <clears throat> to make ours as strong as possible when that time comes? Uh, that's my second concern. And there was one statement made in, in a lot of the reports from the different towns that they have to have an indoor loading uh, area. Does the one on the third line have an indoor loading area on the converted dog kennel? Director Beth. Uh, for you, um, Mayor Mill to Councillor Sainsbury. Uh, with regards to the, excuse me, Planning partnership, Colleen Butler hasn't reviewed the report yet. And that is something we'll be working with with the town solicitor. <clears throat> Excuse me. And at the um, July 26th meeting, the planning partnership intends to take the discussion that was held tonight, as well as the best of the best and make rec and make some options available for the for council and public to to discuss based upon what they've heard and, and, the, and the cases that are before the LPAT and that sort of thing. With regards to the um, indoor loading um, area, I, on that one specific property, I don't have that information, but I can uh, look into that. And um, with regards to the report, um, it will, is, it, the, um, the intention is to have those options and you can take the best of the best. And, and that is what the whole exercise is about is 
coming up with what works best for new Tecumseh. And it, there's a number of hearings still at the LPAT. They are backed up. And, and this is a newer issue that has been raised. So there has been a lot of unresolved um, issues and different bylaws that do different things. So it's challenging with case law at this time to come up with what is the best. And, and tonight we, you know, we heard from some members of our public and there was that one reference to Pelham and that's something we can add to the list. And that list through our discussions with the planning partnership continued to grow as we learned from about other municipalities and their approaches. Great. So Thank is there you. any, and my final oh, question, your worship right. through you to Jennifer again, was just simply uh, the, the different people who spoke tonight mentioned OMAFRA and that was an opinion of the minister that it was not actually passed by the legislature at the province of Ontario related to cannabis. So has that been passed by the legislature or is it still just opinions on somebody phoning somebody down at Queensbury? Uh, through you, Mayor Melton, Councillor Sainsbury. My understanding is an opinion of their interpretation of the provincial policy statement definition. Thank you. Councillor McClellan. Uh, thank you, Worship. I just wanted to um, make a couple of comments here that um, in, in the report to council tonight, OMAFRA and the PPS are referenced six times and all six times it's confirming that this is a crop, that this is an agricultural use. So I continue to wonder why this, this council is so hesitant to take a stand for our municipality, make some rules, make some regulations, setbacks, fences, um, indoor loading, like Councillor Sainsbury mentioned, odor, odor control. We keep bouncing around this ball and expecting someone else to answer the question for us. This is our municipality, let's answer the question. And through you, your worship, to Councillor Jeb, who continuously talks about the opiate crisis in relation to discussing cannabis, it does a complete disservice and it is insulting for people who have actually dealt with a real opiate crisis or families that have dealt with people in an opiate crisis because they're not even on the same, not even in the same ballpark. And it's completely insulting. Find another example. Thank you. Councillor Jeff. I'll respond. Um, poppies are an agricultural crop and they are not allowed to be grown. So for saying that cannabis is an agricultural crop, that produces a pharmaceutical product, doesn't produce food, doesn't produce fiber, does not produce uh, fur. That is in the Ontario Agricultural Act. We have to have our agricultural land to provide food, fiber, fur, for the consumption of Ontarians and Canadians. So to let on that cannabis is like potatoes and carrots and corn and beans is ridiculous. It's a pharmaceutical crop. We have horticultural crops, which is all part of the Agricultural Act too. With the greenhouse, you can produce flowers, you can produce um, uh, tulips and, and sod. That is horticultural type of agriculture. It does not impair the consumer. It improves people's homes. It makes them feel good because they've got wonderful flowers and lawn and whatever, but it does not impair the consumer. And we have a problem too with people that are getting licenses for, and prescriptions for way, far way more than what is required for a human being to consume in a day of cannabis. And so to refer that cannabis is like a regular crop, that is not correct. And um, I know you're gonna to wanna to argue with me about this, so we will agree to disagree on that. And um, I'm sorry that you took offense to that, but I take offense that people consider cannabis as a regular crop when it's not. And OMAFRA has not even finished doing research on it for the odor control for minimum distance separation. There's trial still trying to work on it because it was always an illegal crop. So why would wealth do research on an illegal crop? So we have to wait for that. 
So in the meantime, let's get forward with these. I absolutely agree. We take control of our land use, our planning. So we will make rules and regulations that will suit our municipality. And as um, I think it was Mr. Bonnie said, sheep you're following the other sheep falling off the cliff i can always remember my mom saying if your friends jumped off a cliff would you do it too like let's stand up for our own municipality and get the right thing for them thank you councillor Beatty. i'll allow councillor mcclellan to respond first your worship go ahead okay. councillor mcclellan uh, thank you worship we won't keep going back and forth because obviously we do disagree on a little bit however I never compare cannabis to potatoes, except potatoes I'm pretty sure you can make vodka from, which is an impairment. So, I mean, we can do this all day long, but again, my, I took issue with comparing it to opiates because that's absolutely insane. You can't grow poppies, even though you have to grow them from the ground and they're an agricultural crop because they produce opiates, like opiates. Like, the example is just completely ridiculous and insulting. Thank you, Councillor Beatty. Thanks, Your Worship. Um, one of the things that stuck out to me was uh, the County of Norfolk uh, decision. And I'll just uh, read a little bit from the report. The County of Norfolk in 2019 refused a site-specific zoning bylaw amendment to, per to permit a cannabis operation facility in the rural area. Long story short, it went to LPAT and then the settlement, uh, it went from 150 meter setback to a 12 meter setback. So when I when I read things like that, I, I think there's a need for a little bit of uh, uh, probably some more data and a little more depth when it comes to setbacks and what is actually needed and what isn't. Um, I think you either need to have a specific setback as a number or you don't because when you, you know, when I read things like this, where we can go from 150 to 12, not 112, 12 meters, um, that tells me there needs to be some clarity and there needs to be uh, some definitions as well. Some of the, um, some of the best practices that I was reading through the report that stuck out to me and maybe they stuck out for others, but I'll just share them. Um, I like the idea of, having site plan approval in all cases. I also like uh, how one municipality, I can't remember which one it was in the report, but it said that uh, they don't permit any minor variances uh, permitted by the committee of adjustment, only through a zoning bylaw amendment at council. I would be fully supportive of that. Uh, and uh, air treatment control, I think in most cases should be mandated. Uh, outdoor signage and advertising should be prohibited, but I don't see any harm in having a company sign. I don't, not that uh, we're selling weed here, but the name of the farmer, the name of the property owner, certainly. Um, the other one I noticed was Bradford West Willembury um, included uh, a component that any agricultural cannabis cultivation facility must be set back a minimum of 150 meters from any settlement area boundary. And I'm just wondering through you, your worship to staff, um, Director Best, Director Hoppy, um, I'm wondering if you could provide a little bit of comment on that because there was only one example where this was cited and um, I see merit in this. Uh, Director Best. Through you, Mayor Milne, <laughs> Councillor Beatty. Uh, Many situations they will say to any other type of zone, like a residential zone or a residential use or industrial use. Bradford West Colenberry did spell it out to any settlement boundary. And, and, uh, and that can be uh, something that can be considered in addition to other zones too. Because if you look at our zoning bylaw, we have a variety of zones peppered throughout the landscape. And so those are considerations you need to look at. But Bradford did spell it out and they do have a number of uh, settlement areas and, and that's where the, they uh, put in the 150 uh, meters. Thank you, Director. Um, and uh, I just think for, for uh, just one final point, Your Worship, uh, maybe for the subsequent reports and meetings that will um, come from this, one of the concerns we hear from um, 
property owners and those that uh, have concerns with it is that um, there could be a detrimental impact to their property values. And that's really hard to, that would have been hard to gauge a couple of years ago because I mean, I think we're what, about three years, October, I think is three years into legalization. So, I mean, we didn't have the data or the time yet, but I'm just wondering if um, I'd be interested if there's any research uh, or any data that suggests that these operations, these legal operations uh, under uh, that are fully licensed would have any negative impact. I'd be interested in uh, seeing some uh, data on that if it's available. Uh, thanks, Your Worship. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, moved by uh, Councillor Harris McIntyre, seconded by Councillor Jeb, that the report of PD 2021 3 4 be received. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. And we got CW56, Councillor Sandsbury, the Allison Hornets. Are you playing for them this year, Fran? <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. It's on page three of nine or seven of 26. It's item, uh, it's the park permit holders obligations and it's item four L. And this is how it reads. And I want clarification on whether it needs the word not. Pursue corporate or community sponsorships that would conflict with the sponsorship or advertising activities of the town. Should it say that would conflict or that would not conflict? Director uh, Burton. Through you, Mary Mellon, to Councillor Sainsbury. Uh, thank you for catching that. That is a typo and it should be not conflict. Thank you. Okay, I'll fill in the blank. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. Just because it's an agreement, I thought I dot the I's. You know, the old school teacher in you. <laughs> the teacher in you. <laughs> Moved by Councillor Sainsbury, second by Councillor B.D. Bevers, PRC 2021 14 BDC, and further the bylaw to be enacted authorizing the mayor clerk to enter into a rental agreement with the Alston Hornet Club, subsidy in a form included as attached to one, a report of PRC 20. 21-14. All in favor? Okay, thank you. Uh, before we go in close item, I'm going to call upon uh, uh, General Manager uh, Maury Bedford. Is Lori there? Worship, while we're Sorry, waiting. Through, oh, there she is. So I was going to say through your worship, it looks like Lori was just having uh, some technical difficulties. Looks like she's left the room, so she might be trying to get back in. Okay. Councilor yeah. Harris McIntyre. Great. So um, I'm just looking at the call for volunteers for the South Civco Streams Network for Saturday, July 17th and Saturday, August 14th uh, at, from 9 till noon. And uh, there's going to be along the Nottawasaga River. Pre registration is required. It says, if you enjoy the outdoors and like water, this event may be for you. We will be installing pre repurposed cut conifer trees to the base of eroding banks of, as part of our restoration works. So if you're interested, please contact Sylvia at nottawasaga.com or um, call Nottawasaga Futures and it's extension 107. Great. Or you can contact me and I'll put you in touch with them. Good, thank you. 
Is director or general manager Lori Bedford there? I'm back again. How embarrassing. You <laughs> mentioned John leaving and everything turned to you know what. Uh, I find it ironic that I live dead in the city of Barrie and my internet is this unreliable, but, and I apologize for that, but I was just winding up by saying, you know, some of the areas that he's greatly contributed to the long-term financial planning, um, um, development charge bylaw studies. He was a uh, key in identifying. Lori, Lori, Lori. Yep. I hear you. We, we didn't, we missed everything at the beginning. Oh, I'm sorry. There's so some of the counselors sitting there with a shocked look on their face. I heard, I heard her. Did you? Well, I, I, want, I started by saying that our John Henry is leaving us and uh, moving on to other things. And, and he'll be gone before our, the next council meeting. So this is his last council meeting. And I just wanted to take a moment to, um, to thank him for his contribution to, uh, to the town and to increasing the sophistication of the finance area. Um, he's contributed a lot. You, you, you've seen evidence of his policies and procedures in the procurement area, in some of the finance areas, and certainly in the long-term financial plan and DC studies. He's been, you know, a, a great asset through the budget cycle. So I just wanted to acknowledge and let council know that um, that he'll be moving on, and that our loss will be the city of Aurelia's gain. And, and I wish him all the best when he moves on to Aurelia. Thanks. Thanks, General Manager Lord. And on behalf of council, we definitely will be missing John too, John Henry. But I did warn him that he does have a boat in Aurelia. So ex maybe expect 10 or 12 councillors will be coming up to see him some afternoon uh, with a picnic basket, of course, so, and refreshments and that. So he laughed and he said, we're all always welcome if we're in Aurelia to drop in and see him. So it's our loss, it's Aurelia's game, so. Thanks again, General Manager. Mover and second at the Committee of the Whole convenes into closed session. At what time, Councillor Jeb? Uh, 945, Your Worship. To discuss two items. A verbal report of the CAO with the town solicitor regards to the water supply and uh, HR uh, report. Mover and seconder, please. Mr. Foster, Councilor Noah, thank you, all favors. 